I'm delighted to um, introduce another talk by Shui. Um, Shui also um, gave a lecture at last week's colloquium. Thank you so much. And um, today she's going to talk about can rain and wind from MJO help starting El Nino? And this is work she has done together with Jaglin uh, uh, Gui. Ah, I missed it, Horigui, and um, uh, uh, who was one of the colloquium participants. Um, Shui, welcome, and thanks for your talk. Well, thank you, Judith, and thank you, uh, Anish and Judith. It has been a great work, uh, curriculum and workshop, and thank you for the invitation. So um, we have opportunity to uh, discuss a little more in depth about this particular work. And mostly is Jacqueline's work uh, of her um, PhD thesis. Uh, this just part of a PhD thesis, but she's going to be continuing on quite a this. And a lot of these results are uh, still probably uh, kind of in the early stage. But the goal in this particular uh, study is really try to understand the physical processes and especially the multi scale characteristics that from the rain and the wind from very high frequency phenomena. And that organized into the MGO time scale, which is intraseasonal and upscaling to uh, ENSO time scale. So um, without further ado, let me just start this process. I'm gonna turn off the video just to save the bandwidth. See if I can forward the screen. So somehow, okay. All right, so um, what is MGO, right? So we often wanted to check how simple can we get? So this is a kind of a thing that both lots of the current website put up for explaining this. So as you can see, this person says, well, it's rain tomorrow, MGO is in phase one. And then they say, are you sure? So let's check, blah, blah, blah. So, so you know, you can see the MGO getting into this sort of a common space of a science. I'm having a hard time to advance my. Okay. Um, what is ENSO? This is the NOAA's website and talking about ENSO, he says, sweet is another El Nino. And El Nino is a weather pattern that occurs in the West Pacific Ocean, but it is so big that it affects global um, weather all over the world. So there's a common theme here. This two cartoons link a something that we are talking about these phenomena, that's a rain. So somehow these rains seem to be a common theme in these, but we haven't really studied what's the rain um, in the air sea coupled system that contributed to this multi-scale air sea interaction and actually help transfer scale from the high frequency to low frequency. But seriously, so this is kind of a thing so you can sort of look up and uh, has been showing many times before. So MGO is this East War propagating precipitating shift system with strong westerly wind burst. And it's on the intra seasonal time scale. It's a 30 to 90 days. And then if you look at ENSO again, you see these, um, rain said from West Pacific toward the Central Pacific, eventually moving on to uh, the West, the, uh, the Eastern Pacific. And the, during this much longer time scales into annual two to seven years, but it certainly have this ocean basin scale property of rain, SST and the upper ocean thermocline and, and so on, so on. So, MGO has not been drawn this type of things on the ocean counterpart until I saw this figure on a website that uh, it was drawn by the, uh, I think it's a National Weather Service in Boulder. And uh, I have to say that I was really impressed by this cartoon and I have to find it also who, who the actual person drawn this. But this is a depiction of MGO in the tropical Pacific Ocean. And you can sort of see the way they drawn based on MGO active phase, surprise phase, and ahead of MGO. 
So the important things I want to draw your attention is also the ocean part. Right? The upper ocean, they're looking at temperature anomaly. So they're looking at a warm ocean anomaly underneath MGO. And uh, the same time they join these propagation of a Kevin wave and, and so on, so on. There's a, quite a lot to it. But the important thing is really connection to this part that MGO connection to ENSO, and this is the minus three and four. But the question in this diagram, obviously this is a very nice depiction, but in fact, these phenomena do not occur simultaneously as this thing is drawing. In fact, MGO, when you see the ocean warming, MGO already passed to its active phase. So this is where this study is examining the period of time when the MGO is active in the West Pacific. How does in time that influence the upper ocean warming that eventually pushing quite a bit of cold, warm water toward the Central Pacific? So keep that in mind and you can see the currents that they're drawing there. And I'll, we'll address this because this part is actually different than we find recently from both observations and the modeling work. So this is the um, way that we track MGO because in order to study the detailed um, MGO impact, we need to look at the MGO rain, which I presented this in the lecture. And just repeating this, that we are tracking the precipitation associated with wind, surface winds. So our Clearly, there's enhanced the precipitation associated with MGO and also westerly winds. Um, these have really uh, sort of a strong impact on the ocean part, and then uh, produces something very uh, interesting that that uh, kind of induces this uh, multi-scale air sea interaction process. Um, so, using this method, this is based on observations. So we are looking at the observational data to see how much of this MGO in observations you can associate with the ENSO or, or El Nino, uh, this onset of El Nino in the uh, Central Pacific. So in this paper, uh, Jacqueline and I uh, put together for using over 20 years of data, we'll First, we kind of looking at particular event, each events. So this is uh, to the left corner here. Can, can you see my cursor? Yeah, we Sorry, can see. Okay. Right, so you can see the multi-MGO event uh, that this particular year, 2018, um, that associated with strong winds. And it's this warming um, toward the Central Pacific so basically this, we call it the warm pool eastward extension. It's a coincide with this uh, turn of the La Nino to El Nino phase. So this is where we refer to as onset. So looking at this warming, maximum warming occurs after MGO. So that's really a key uh, factor you should uh, keep in mind. Then if you look at the 20 years data, that this 20 years, and then you can see the six um, El Nino event, right? It's so all preceded by a very strong and a persistent MGO event uh, marked by this red. We've done statistics in this particular paper and really uh, convinced that MGO has quite to do with this eastward pushing of the warm pool, which is this is magenta color, and that's the, uh, the actual uh, SST compared to climatology. It really is a significant. So a key finding in that, which remember I mentioned the timing of this. So if you look at MGO induced warming in spatial space, then during the MGO, uh, there's kind of warming there uh, because certain process I'll get to in a second. And then you will see the Central Pacific warming is the largest. If you subtract the two, you get to see the projection of the MGO warming that getting into the so uh, the Nino three and four space. So that really tells you the post MGO warming is actually play a central role to this. 
So just quickly uh, as review, the MGO induced upper ocean dynamics both introduced the, uh, the Westerly Wimbers induced the Kevlin wave, which has been documented in this study a uh, long time ago. And also a uh, long time ago during total core, we actually observed the MGO induced precipitation and wind can actually uh, induce upper ocean barrier layer that actually kind of blocking the, uh, the thermal climate upwelling and the wind in, uh, influence to the upper ocean that help the warming and that you get the uh, maximized surface uh, solar heating during this phase. So this is all well-known effect. So then we start using a model, a uh, couple of model to examine the, the physical process. So what is going on in terms of MGO and warming, right? So this particular model that we have, it coupled the uh, atmosphere, which is wharf and the ocean as ocean, it's a high calm circulation model. That's our model domain. Um, we have done experiment. I don't want to go through any of the details. So you can read these later on. And uh, we we've simulated this uh, over uh, many months of this year, up to several MGO events up to the onside of the ENSO. Um, in this particular study, we actually uh, conduct experiment. We want to know what's the influence of the precipitation and the coupling to salinity that have impact on this particular uh, mechanism that we're talking about here. So just quickly, if you look this period uh, time that I'm uh, at our couple model simulation of ocean temperature, and the salinity, you will find this uh, warm pool, this is the temperature, the warm pool has this eastward propagating properties and is associated with the uh, Kevin wave usually induce this uh, steepening of thermocline. And if you look at the salinity, it's clearly showing this, uh, the fresh pool propagating uh, eastward. And this fresh pool, actually contribute quite a bit to this barrier layer formation as well. Um, so the, uh, again, you know, there's a lot of details on the figure. So not to worry too much, except to say that this colors now is looking at the difference between the control simulation and the one we removed the uh, precipitation and evaporation coupling. So clearly the impact of rain has a very large impact on the salinity, which means the fresh water and warming of the ocean. And it's very clear physical mechanism that tells us that uh, the fresh water pool is definitely play a central role here. Then if you follow a particular NGO event in the middle part that you will see this very uh, uh, strong fresh water pool propagate eastward with a positive velocity, which means this water itself is moving against wind. This is a new result because prior to this, we haven't realized that this big fresh water pool is propagating against the wind, which means this is really driven by upper ocean dynamics. And then it also accompanied with this uh, very strong warming, uh, eastward propagating warming. So, uh, in order to really see this multi-scale process that you will have to look at a detailed process in terms of a, we separate the West Pacific, Central Pacific and the East Pacific. So not worry about too much about the details, except to say, if you look at the temperature, the red is the one from a control simulation minus one without uh, the, the uh, salinity coupling. And you can see the one in control simulation with fresh water definitely have this warming effect and the diurnal cycle uh, heating during the warming process that actually have all these large warming uh, kind of associated with this sh shallower of the mixed layer, uh, shallower of the, uh, the barrier layer, ocean barrier layer. And this warming is actually under these studies, not under MGO is really post MGO. So if you look at the uh, Central Pacific, East Pacific, that warming definitely occurs that 
the MGO didn't reach this far, but it's through the operation process itself. So, so I don't we, think that you, huh? you can wrap up in two minutes or so. Sure, I hope so. Thank um, you. Let's not worry about this. All I want to tell you that we did a detailed budget calculation, try to figure out what's driving this, uh, the currents, western currents against the wind, right? So basically, Yakling has did all the calculations. So we will find this one particular term in the upper ocean that drives the ocean current is a pressure gradient. Um, okay, so these each terms are displayed here, but I want to come to this particular slides to show you that. So first of all, we want to check is the model actually um, be validated by observations. Sure enough, we have a particular modeling at 165. So this is a time series during this event. So basically, uh, as you can see, <laughs> we don't have a detailed measurements of fresh water, but enough to tell us the freshening over uh, this period of time and the warming uh, during this period of time. And very importantly, that there is observed jet and this particular jet has very strong uh, speed, uh, this as a centimeter per second, which is very similar with, with what model is showing. And the model shows you the mechanism that is really driving through, not through wind stress or anything else, but the pressure gradient of the fresh water versus the, uh, uh, the salty water in that region. So, uh, so basically, this has come to the summary of that. So the, 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 the things I've mentioned before. So from the Central Pacific, uh, the West Pacific, we have these kind of a physical mechanism rain in those fresh water. And then this thing will propagate uh, eastward. And uh, during this time, the MGO kind of subsided, the precipitation part. But then under the easterly wind, this water part become very much on its own moving eastward and driven by ocean upper ocean dynamics. So during this time, as soon as we were moving the SSD gradient toward the central Pacific, the treat winds start to relax. And then at a later stage, after months, several MGO events, you will see this, uh, the warming over the region where the uh, El Nino started getting onset. So with that, and some of the results are summarizing some manuscripts that we've been writing. So in summary, um, I guess we answered that question. We, do, we did convince ourselves the rain and the winds from the MGO can help start a um, El Nino event. So this, uh, the uh, coupling precipitation and the evaporation and salinity, it really play a very, very important role for Earth system modeling uh, people that I think you really want to make sure this part uh, is resolved in the model. Then in combination of the many things that we can, I guess I'll end the, the slideshow, right? I don't know, let's see, sorry. Um, then the combination of the high frequency phenomena and the then upper ocean dynamics, like deepening of the mixed layer and the shoaling of the barrier layer all play a very important role after several weeks. And as several events can accumulate over months to leading to the warming. So if we can do this well, then we believe Angio is a source of predictability can really bridging the weather and climate from the high frequency to low frequency phenomena. So Yakni is going to be doing her future work using CSM2 to uh, looking at a multi-year event. So thank you. That's all I have. Thanks very much, Shui. Thank you for this comprehensive talk. I learn something new each time I listen to it. Um, so uh, we have the first question from Hemi. Hemi, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Shui, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, my question is about the MGO dipole structure. So the MGO in anomalous sense, it has also active and the suppressed phase and suppressed phase may have the opposite wind direction and uh, rain. So how does the suppressed phase play a role in this uh, mechanism? Right, so if that's a good question. So if you can think of MGO kind of always like 
proceed by a surprise phase and also after MGO is a surprise phase, right? So yeah. in fact, during that surprise phase, it's the most warming occur. So we call the, the post-MGO warming. And then that process is describing this particular study. So MGO surprise phase is very important in that way for Central Pacific, the West Pacific, Central Pacific, because that's time when we have a large warming and the post-MGO surprise phase, the fresh water injected into ocean can stay alive by itself for another uh, several weeks and two months. Mm -hmm. So I do think that it's a part of this whole dynamic system. It's a part of the, uh, the air interaction process that it has not been examined before. Mm -hmm. So it certainly has this important role. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? So I had one. Sure. Thanks, Shui. A great talk. I was wondering about the 2014-15 failed El Nino versus 2015-16, where we had the big El Nino event. And was there this P precipitation evaporation salinity coupling that actually happened in 2015-16 and did not happen in 2014-15 when we had the failed El Nino? I guess how important is this event for like the big El Nino events like the uh, 97, 98 and the 82, 83? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I don't think uh, these sort of a totality of the INSO El Nino events can be explained by one particular phenomena either. So basically, if you can think of a INSO itself, it's a dynamic system can exist on its own independently of MGO. MGO also exists, right? So independently, they are interacting in the real world. As we heard that, you know, sometimes model having problem is how to superimpose of the two dynamic system. So, so I do believe a lot of times we have a field MGO not, a field uh, and so yeah. not, perhaps have something to do with this trigger mechanism. Right. So the large scale may be ready to go, but we're lacking of a trigger mechanism. And I, we sort of start looking at the high frequency phenomena, MGO, like several months before the so onset, they do have a different frequency and intensity. Um, so indication is that this trigger mechanism is very important and how that two dynamic system interacting in time and space. And I think it's important. I'm ho certainly hoping that the community pay attention to, we can use much more sort of longer time scale to look at the entire two decades and see what happens. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shui. Um, um, so now uh, we're gonna go to...